Hello and welcome everybody, this is Roland from GraphicInMotion.com and it is tutorial time again. And this is really a special tutorial because it is my first ever Houdini tutorial. If you follow along my channel for a while, and this channel exists since more than 11 years now, I mainly released After Effects tutorials and some Cinema 4D tutorials. But in the last year I started to learn Houdini and now I feel finally comfortable enough to share some of the knowledge that I gathered. As my first Houdini tutorial, I chose a vellum cloth simulation. We will create these nice fluffy pillows that you can see here. And the special trick here is to create these nice creases and to make this really look like it's stitched together from real cloth. I was inspired to create this tutorial when I watched a Cinema 4D tutorial from Grayscale Gorilla. And I just wanted to try out whether I can recreate this inside Houdini. And I think that it worked out quite nice. So in this tutorial you will learn how to use volume modeling to create a shape. Then we will do some UV unwrapping inside Houdini. And then we will set up a cloth and volume simulation and set up these nice creases. So now, without further ado, let's jump right into Houdini and let's get started with the tutorial. In the first part of this tutorial I will show you how to use volume modeling to create shapes in Houdini. If you take a look at this pack here that I created, I actually created 100 different shapes and I used volume modeling for nearly all of these shapes. If you want to get these shapes, you can get them on Gumroad, but you can also get them on Patreon. So if you are a patron, if you support me on Patreon, then you will get this pack for free and you can also get it on Gumroad. You will get an FBX file with all of these elements included and you will also get this original Houdini file and here you can really dive in and check out each of these objects and also check out how these were created. So this is something that I wanted to show you. But today we are going to focus on this object here. So I will show you how to model this and then we will use this for our cloth simulation. So let me create a new Houdini scene. As a first step we will create a geometry node and call this our object and dive in. I will start this process with a line, a simple line. And I want to make sure that it sits in the middle here. So I could either change the origin now, but I think that this is tedious. So I will use a node called match size. And by the default settings, you see that it will just put it right in the middle here. Now I want to resample it. You know, now I have two points on this line, but I want to create more points because I will use these points later for volume modeling. So let's resample this line and let's make sure that we have a bunch of points. So let's make sure that the segment length is really small. Now I can use a transform node to create my cross shape and I will just simply rotate this 90 degrees along the z-axis and I will merge these two together. Then I have two lines like so. Now I will feed this into a VDB from particles. And this is cool because Houdini generally treats points as particles. And you see what we get now. Now we have this huge blob here. And of course this is a little bit too big. So let's change the point radius to 0 0.2 here. Uh, let's make this smaller. 0 0.2, yeah that's better. And let's make this voxel size also smaller, 0 0.01, because then we get some detail in the middle here. Now this is not geometry yet, it's only a volume, so it is made out of voxels. And what Houdini actually does uh, behind the scenes here, if I turn down the resample frequency, you see it just creates a sphere, a volumetric sphere for each point. So this is how it changes points into volumes. And yeah, if you make the distance between them small enough, or maybe even, even smaller, then you will get this shape. I think that 0 0.01 is enough. Now we can remesh that, or we can turn it into a mesh by using a 
convert VDB node and tell the convert VDB node to convert it to polygons. And now we have a mesh. But this mesh, of course, is not suitable for simulations and not for UV unwrapping, so we have to work on that a little bit. In my case, I want to remesh it. And if we type in remesh in Houdini, you see we have a few options here. We have the remesher, and this one will create triangles that can be really good for cloth simulations, but because we want to create seams and UV maps, this is not working. The remesh to grid is actually this whole process that I did now, like converting it into a VDB and then reconverting it back into, into polygons in one node. So this does exactly the same thing. But what I really want to use is this labs exercise quad remesher. And this is a really great tool. And before I activate this now, so before I start cooking this, let me turn off auto cooking. And let's set up a symmetry. I want this result to be symmetrical on X, Y, and Z. And I also want the target size to be 2000 for now. And then I will run it. So let's activate it and then turn on auto cook. And now it will calculate my mesh. And you see what we've got now. And you see it's really a, a nice mesh. So it is symmetrical, it has these nice loops running around it, and we can really use this now to create UVs and to create our seams for our glass simulation. And this is what I will show you in the next step. So in this step, we will UV unwrap our object. Before I do that, let me subdivide it one more time, because I want to have a little bit more geometry for the simulation later on. Um, it is still not really much, so the simulation will be quite sparse, let's say it like that, but for the sake of this tutorial it's okay because then the simulation just runs a little bit faster. If you want to do something for production, then you should probably subdivide it even a bit more. Now I want to specify some edges, and to do that I will use my select tool and then go to the edge mode. You can see these points where these lines here come together. And I think that these are the perfect edges to use as seams for our class simulation. So to select them, you just double click and you see it will select, Houdini will select the line until this point because here it just doesn't know which direction. Usually when you double click, it will try to select the loop, right, like here. But in this case, yeah, it doesn't know where the loop continues. So unfortunately, we have to do this manually. Just hold down shift and then continue selecting all of these lines to get the seams for our class simulation. And I will speed up this process now. OK, so now I selected all the seams that I need. And to store them, I will press the tab with my mouse cursor inside the viewport and write group to create a group out of my selection. And now this is an edge group. To rename this, I will simply put in $OS here. And now I can specify the group name right on the node. And this is my seams group. So let's call it seams. And if I take a look at the information here, now you see we have an edge group called seams. To UV unwrap this, we will use a node that's called UV flatten. So let's use the UV flatten node. And this is the one that you want to choose if you selected seams. So you see we have a seams drop down here, and here we can put in our group. And now it unwrapped it along our seams and we have all these patches. And this is perfect for our cloth simulation, because if you would create something out of cloth, you would probably stitch it together from different patches. And yeah, this will give us a really nice result. The only problem with these UVs now is that these are overlapping. So we have to lay out them and therefore we can use the UV layout tool and just by default, this will separate all of our islands and will put it into our texture. You see some of them are now a little bit twisted and yeah, if this disturbs you, then you can come in here and change this. You can do this by simply going in here. Uh, let's go press space and five to go to the UV layout. And now you can double click here and then press the tab and choose UV edit. 
And this will create a UV edit node. And now you could start rotating these, shifting them around, scaling and everything. But in my case, I don't care because this will work perfectly with the materials that I used for the preview. So this UV layout is fine. So now it's time to prepare our mesh for simulation. And to prepare it for the simulation, I need two steps. First of all, I want to put in a peak node. And with this peak node, I will run this only over my seams group. So let's make sure that seams is specified here. And now if I press enter, you see that I have this little arrow here, this red one, and now I can push this. And I want to push these in just a little bit, not too much, just a little bit, push them in so that I, I have these slight creases already visible here in my mesh. So let's say that a value of minus 0 0.006 is fine. And you see that you get these slight display problems here. So let's turn off the UVs for now. And this just has to do with the normals. We can't correct this in the end then. The last step before we set up the volume simulation is to create a mask attribute. I want to create a mask attribute that runs along my seams because I will use this later on in the simulation. So to do that, there is a node called mask by feature. Let's connect this here. And the mask by feature is really a cool tool. So if you take a look now at the mask and let's visualize this for a moment. You see that this mask is now created by a direction and direction here is the y direction so the value here from the top down is one and down here it's zero and it yeah creates this nice fall off in between but we do not want to use a direct direction we want to use a point cloud and to create this point cloud we will use our seams group so right now the seams are stored on edges but if I promote this group by using a group promote node, we can store the selection to or convert it to points. So let's make sure that we have our group seams selected and we want to convert it from edge to points. If we activate this, you see now it is a point group. And now we can bring this in here to our point cloud connection here. And now you see it is already using this point cloud. But we didn't even select it here. So I changed it to point cloud, but the source is not even in here. So let's really select our source here because then we get this really nice result here. And now you can change the angle. So here you see you can make this yeah, a little bit smaller maximum points. Yeah, this also will change the radius. So this is probably something that we want. And let's see. Yeah, let's bring it in a little bit maybe something like this 75 here is all right then we can turn off cast shadows because then we will have even better distribution of values here and here down here you can remap the mask so you can for example come in here now and reshape this a little bit if it's necessary but in my case i think it's not it just creates a little bit of a strange mask. No, it's not necessary to remap this. But now I have a mask feature that is stored on the points and I can use this in my simulation. So now it's time to set up the volume simulation. Hi, sorry for the interruption. If you liked the tutorial so far, then please consider supporting me on Patreon. Learning and teaching new motion design softwares and techniques is one of my great passions. With your support and Patreon, I would be able to follow this passion and create more educational content for you guys. As benefits, you will get access to project files, to resources like 3D models, and you will get exclusive tutorials. I also created a Discord channel where I want to build a motion designers community where you can share your work, where you can get feedback, or you can get help with your project. So please check out Patreon and check out the Discord server. The links are down in the video description. And now let's get back to the tutorial. To get this nice pillow shape with these nice wrinkles, we will use a balloon setup. And to use this, we just type in Vellum balloon. And then we get this Vellum configure balloon. And this will create two nodes, two Vellum constraint nodes. 
So let's add in a vellum solver and let's link this to our geometry. And now let's see how we can set this up. So we have two constraints here. The first one is set to cloth. And you can think about this as the hull, as the fabric that is controlling the stiffness and the bendiness of our cloth. And the pressure constraint that's set to pressure is the air pressure inside of our balloon. We use it to create a pillow, but actually you can think about it as air pressure or the, the filling or the stuffing of our pillow. If you want to inflate this object now, you can go to the pressure and just increase the rest length scale. So if I put this to 1.5 and let the simulation run, but before I run it, I will turn off the gravity here so that it floats in the middle of our scene. And then I start this simulation. And you see now it tries to inflate it. And there are actually a few values that are very important here. So first of all, the cloth stiffness, the cloth rest length scale, the bend stiffness, and then this rest length value. These are the values that are creating our look. If you want to get some wrinkles now, you could, for example, just come in here and increase the rest length scale on the stretch here on the cloth, vellum cloth. So if I put this to 1.5 and then let's run this again, you will see now we suddenly get something totally different. So now this looks really clothy and we have all of these wrinkles, but now we do not have enough pressure to inflate it. So this way we'll not really get these creases that we want. The method that you want to use here is that we want to assign different rest length values for the seams, for the, for the creases, and for the rest of the cloth. So how can we do that? If we take a look here, we have these three inputs. And the first one is the geometry. And if I make this a little bit smaller, you can see it down here. The first one is geometry. The second one are the constraints. And the third one are collisions, but we do not use these for now. I want to manipulate the rest length and the rest length is actually stored on the constraint stream. So let's put in a null here on these constraints. And let's say that these are my constraints, just that I know what this is. Let's go back, roll back our simulation. I want to bring this mask feature that we have now stored on our points onto our constraints. So let's bring in an attribute transfer and link it up like this. The constraint stream goes into the first input and my mask feature goes into the second and I will just add in points here by holding down old to make this a little bit more obvious, like so. And now we set it up like this. We actually want to transfer a point attribute so we can disable or deactivate the primitives. And now we choose our mask attribute. And this is now stored on my constraints. But the constraints work on primitives and not on points. So we need to promote this primitive. So let's go or this attribute. Use an attribute promote here. You see, if I click here, then the mask is stored on the points. And if I go down here and say, I want this from points to primitives, and choose the mask here. Now, if I middle mouse click here, you see that my mask is now stored on the primitives right here. And this is exactly what I need. And if I click this now to visualize this, you see that now the value from my mask are actually really stored on my primitives. Now we want to use this mask value to manipulate our rest length. So how can we do that? Therefore, we need to write one line of code. So we'll use an attribute wrangle and put this in here. It's important that this runs over primitives because the constraints are running over primitives. And it's also possible to specify a certain group that we want to influence. If you take a look at the cloth tab here, the cloth node, you see that we have these output groups. We have the stretch group that is controlling the stretch stiffness of our cloth. We have the bend 
group here that's controlling the bend stiffness and we also have the same option here on pressure or on the stretch group here it's not activated so we could now just create a group that's called pressure because this is actually uh, controlling our pressure in this case and, and not really the stretch now we have a group pressure and we have a group stretch if we come into our wrangle now we can specify these two groups so let's say we want to run this code over our pressure and over our stretch group and now let's type in our code so we want to manipulate the rest length and rest length is an attribute that is used by vellum so it knows this attribute and we want to use a lerp function to manipulate it let's take a look at the lerp function and what is required to use that first of all the lerp function performs a linear interpolation between two values and you can use an amount to interpolate between these. Our amount will be the mask amount. The mask value is between 0 and 1, so now we can control the rest length along our mask. So we know that the last value here is the mask. So let's set in here or let's type in here mask. Now we have to figure out what are our first two values. So the first value will be just the rest length. This will be whatever we put into our nodes. And then we want to create a new rest length attribute, or not a new one, but we will use the same rest length, but multiply it with a value. And therefore we will create a float channel. And now I didn't write this incorrectly, so let's do it again. Channel float, like this, and we call it rest scale. And if I press Alt E here, then you can really see that what I did here. So let's make this bigger. So uh, at rest length is lerp, then from rest length to rest length, time the channel float, that's called rest scale. And then, of course, we need to do calmer and not this one here. And we want to run this along our mask and apply. And now we can click this here to create our rest scale value. So this should now work. Let's take a look whether it works. And of course, it does not work. So let's take a look what mistake did I make. And of course, I forgot some parentheses here. Now it should work. Let's link this up now to our constraints into the solver. So first of all, I will set it to one. So we do not change the value here because right now, let's set this back to one again here. And this one is set to 1.5. So let's see what this does now. Let's activate the solver. You see, not much is happening here. Okay. How can we do this? So first of all, let's set this to a lower number, like 0 0.5. And if we run the simulation now, again, nothing is, seems to happen. But this is only because our cloth is just a little bit too stiff. So if we go now into our cloth constraint and lower the bend stiffness, so let's lower it to 0 0.001, and let's run this simulation again, and you see, now slowly something is happening. Yeah, you can see, okay, now we get these creases. They are a little bit more visible, but it's still not really what we want. So, first of all, let's increase the rest length scale of the stretch stiffness to one point, let's say 1.2. And the pressure here is set to 1.2. That's okay for now, I think. Oops, now it's calculating, so let's end this. The pressure is set to 1.5. Yeah, that's okay. And let's make sure that this is correctly assigned. Yeah, it is. And now let's run this again. Let's take a look what we have now. And you see, now I have what I expected. Now I have these nice wrinkles, but along our creases, it is pushing together. So you can imagine this like the cloth wants to push together along these creases, so it, it wants to shrink. But the pressure is actually working against this. And this is how you get these nice folds. And the lower you set this bend stiffness, the crazier these folds get. If you go too low, then it will break at some point. 
So if we take a look at this, now you see we get very, very small wrinkles. Of course, we do not have that much geometry now, but you see this is very wrinkly now. It looks actually pretty good. There is another thing that you can do that's pretty cool. If you go to the cloth constraint and actually increase the stiffness a little bit. So let's increase this to 1000 instead of 100. And let's run this simulation again. And now this will push in even further because now it's stiffer. And now the rest length has more impact on this. And if we now increase the pressure a little bit to, to contradict this, so maybe to 1.8 or yeah, let's try 1.8 for now. To get back a little bit of inflation again. Now you see we have this. And if I increase this pressure even further, maybe to 2.5. Let's take a look what this does. And you see now we get also a very nice result. So the creases are nicely trying to push in and the pressure is working against this. So this is how these forces somehow play together. So the stiffer you make this stretch constraint here, the more pressure you will need to expand it. But actually for me, this is a little bit too much. So I will go back here and change this to, let's say, yeah, a value of 600, because this is a multiplication here, 6 times 100, and that's fine. And the pressure, we reduce this again. And let's turn off the simulation. And let's actually also turn off this. And let's say we want to have 1 point, yeah, maybe 1.8. And let's turn off our grid, for example, here. So like this. And now let's see what we get. And now we should get this really fluffy and smooth pillowy style. And of course, it doesn't look too good now because, yeah, I didn't use enough geometry here. But what you can do to improve this is you can use a vellum post process. So let's put this in here and wire it up. And what this does is you can, on the one hand, blur your animation, your simulation. And if you take a look here at these creases, if you blur this, they will vanish. That's not what we want, of course, but you can do it if it gets too crazy. And then you can also subdivide it. And, and this is definitely good for, for this here. So if you subdivide this one time, you see it looks already better if you subdivide it two times. Yeah, it doesn't make that much of a difference. If you turn on the grid, you see that it's now a very dense mesh. But I think that this is fine for now. And yeah, the rest now is up to you. Now you can play around with all these values and generate different stiffness, different fluffiness and create your pillows however you want. I took a little break and organized this file a little bit better. So you see now everything is nicely grouped and labeled because you can of course download this project file also on my Patreon. But now I want to show you how we can add a few more of these objects into our simulation. So to do that, let me quickly create a little bit of space here. So I will take everything from the volume simulation and drag it down here. And now let's put in a null here, actually. Like so. And I will actually also reconnect this here to here. Bring this down like so. And now I want to create some duplicates. So let's make sure that we are on frame number zero and that everything is nice. Here we have the mask, that's good. And now I want to create a transform here. So let's add in a transform. And with this transform now, let's take a look whether our mask is still there. Everything should be fine here. So if we visualize the mask, I just want to make sure that this is working and it is. And now let's create a merge node because I will create some duplicates and then just merge them back together. So like so. And let's just cut this connection. And now I will shift this a little bit out of the way and transform it or rotate it a little bit, just like so. 
then we create a duplicate by holding down Alt, merging this in here, activating the merge, and now we can put this over here, rotate it around, maybe scale it down a tiny bit, like so, create another one, hold down Alt, merge it in, and move this over here. I just create a very quick and simple layout and I scale it down also. And then we just do another one. Let's duplicate this one here, merge it back in. Let's make this like so. And let's see, put this over here, scale it down. Maybe push it up a little bit and finally rotate it somehow. That is a bit random. Okay, so I don't want to push them too far apart so that they do not need too long to collide. But I think that this is, this is okay for now. And now let's quickly create a text box here so that the file is nicely organized for you guys. Uh, let's take this color here and just name it duplicates. And before we run the simulation, now I want to add some movement to these because right now there is no force in our simulation that moves our, our objects. And to do that, we can enter the vellum solver here. Just double click the vellum solver and here we can plug in our forces. You see, there is already some kind of a comment in here that explains what you can do here. So you can wire in forces directly into this output and you can use the pop forces. And there is one very cool one that I really like and that's the pop axis force. So let's take a look where I can find it. Um, or maybe it's not called pop, sorry. Let's search it again, axis force. Yeah, here it is, pop axis force. And this axis force combines three different forces in one node. So we have this axis in the middle here, and we have this sphere. Let's make this sphere a little bit bigger, that all of our elements and all of our objects are inside. And now we can take a look at the speed. We have the orbit speed that will just orbit our objects around our axis center. The lift speed will lift them up, we will not use this, and the suction speed will suck them in. The orbit speed and the suction speed kind of fight each other like uh, gravitational forces. So let's set this up with an orbit speed of 0.3 and we increase the suction speed a little bit because I want them to collide in the middle. And now let's get up here. Then on the vellum solver in the simulation, I want to increase the cache memory so that I can cache out a little bit more of this simulation. And now I want to go back and change the settings actually to the settings that I used in the preview video. So I used a stretch stiffness on the cloth tab of 600 here. I used a rest length scale of 1.1. And here on the pressure I just had, I think it was 1.3. And on the attribute wrangle that we created, I had a rest length scale of 0.5. Good, now I will run the simulation and I will be back when it's finished. Good, so I simulated about 170 frames. And I think with these settings, it's really quite cool because they are really soft and fluffy. And if we take a look now at the simulation, let's take a look. The forces are a little bit fast, so I could now go in there and change the forces directly on the pop axis. But I can also do something different. I can also go to the vellum solver and here in the solver, we have the option to change the time scale. And for example, if I put in here 0.7, then the simulation will be slower. So I will run this again and I will be back when it's finished. Good, the simulation is finished and I'm quite happy with the result. You see, it's now a little bit smoother a little bit slower and with this time scale you can create really nice slow motion effects. If you find any collision problems in your simulation, for example that the meshes are intersecting or something, then you can start playing around with the sub steps or with the collision passes here. In this case I will leave it at the default because I think that it really doesn't look too bad 
And of course, if you increase these passes here, then the simulation duration will be longer. But it will have definitely an influence of how this looks. So the higher the substeps, the stiffer the cloth gets. This is what you have to keep in mind. So it really depends on what you want to achieve. But I'm quite happy with this very soft look that we have here. Okay, so this is it with this tutorial. I hope that you liked it and that you learned something new. Please let me know in the comments whether you like that I do Houdini tutorials now. And I think that there will be more Houdini tutorials in the future because I'm really excited about this program and I really want to dive deeper inside and learn more and share my knowledge with you guys. So I thank you very much for watching and I really hope to see you soon. Goodbye.